Okay, continuing on. Eating and victory. Ultimately, the seventh day, the millennium, is a feast. That's what we're headed for. That's what God's been training us for, a feast. We learn to eat Christ today. We're going to feast on him tomorrow. He's prepared a table for us in the presence of our enemies. That's an eating thing. Even spiritual warfare is about eating. I'm enjoying Christ. He's pouring his oil on my head, and I know I'm going to dwell in his house forever. Amen. I'm sitting and enjoying the feast. That's how I win the war. What does it mean to win the war? It means that I'm full of Christ. You can say whatever you want about me, and the more you say, the more I eat, the more, I, the more satisfaction I gain, and the more miserable you become because you're not eating. You're spitting, all, or spit, you're spitting out all the food all over the place. <laughs> you show that you don't understand spiritual things because you misapply every verse. You do not live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You take the words not as life, but as instruction. It's the letter that kills. And Paul makes that real clear in Corinthians 3. The word can be letter or it can be life. It's the spirit that gives life. And it all depends on what you're beholding. Amen. We all with unveiled face, 2 Corinthians 3.18. That's a holy of holies reference. Where we're in the holy of holies with the Shekinah glory are beholding as in a mirror the Lord, the, the glory of the Lord. We're in rest in the Sabbath in God's day, focused on what he has provided as an inheritance, which is a person, Christ himself. Amen. We all with unveiled faces behold as in a mirror with, or we all with, with, we all with unveiled faces beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image. What's the mirror? It's the word. James shows us that there's a mirror. When James is talking about it, he's talking about looking at the law and looking at your natural face. He says, he who's not a hearer of the word, but not a doer, or he, excuse me, yeah, he who's not a hearer of the word, but not a doer is like someone looking at his natural face in the mirror and he walks away and forgets what kind of person he saw. We're not to look at the natural man throughout, or we're not, we're not to look at the natural man through the mirror of the law unless we still haven't agreed that we are condemned and need to be crucified with Christ. If we're looking at the natural man, it's because we still don't understand. We think we're righteous. We think we're good apart from God. The mirror is there to show us that that isn't the case. But we didn't, or excuse me, but we need to flip the mirror so that eventually I'm looking not at myself and how I'm doing and how I'm performing to try to copy or emulate, which is a work of the flesh. Emulation is a work of the flesh. Instead, I am focused, or excuse me, instead I am focusing the mirror on Christ, whose image I hope to be uh, to behold in the word. As I behold him, I'm transformed metabolically by what I assimilate. He becomes my life. He becomes, excuse me, he comes into me. That's what he wants through the word. His word is not to give you instructions of how to be something. His word is to present himself as your food so that he will and you will become Christ on display. That's what he wants. The church is for Christ, and Christ is for the church. His intention is to be so a part of you that he's been digested by you so that whatever you do is just Christ. Yes, it's you doing it. Yes, it's you choosing it. But you've been renewed. You're a part of the new creation. Your mind is renewed. Your mind is life and peace. He's giving life to your mortal body. As you do what you want, it's actually Christ working with you as your life. This is the Christian life, which is supernatural and demonstrated by the tree of life. Amen. From the beginning, God intended to come into man and be man's life 
live in man, and express himself in man. So he formed man in his image, gave him dominion, and set him in a place where he had access to the tree of life. Man should have taken that life in so that man should have taken that life in so that he could hold that dominion and image in incorruptibility. However, our problem is that we have a reflection of the image of God, but it's corruptible. It dissolves at the slightest pressure unless we have his life in us. When we have his life in us, God delights in bringing us through pressure situations to show forth the virtues of his incorruptible life in us. Amen. This is discussed in 1 Peter, uh, excuse me, this is discussed in 1 Peter. Manifold trials are for providing, excuse me, are for proving our faith, which is more precious than gold because it's incorruptible and abounds to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The tree of life represents eternal life, which is a gift that can be obtained with, with compulsion, or excuse me, the tree of life represents eternal life, which is a gift that can be obtained without compulsion. You don't have to read the Bible, enjoy Christ, or understand spiritual things to be saved. You could be justified, believed he forgave you. Uh, you could be justified, believe he forgave your sins, and go on with your life. But you would be more miserable because you're poor and hungry. God wants to bring you into the house and feed you, which is the intention behind the tree of life and our salvation. Our enjoyment of salvation starts when we learn to feast on Christ, which is presented throughout scripture as the word. God's intention is not for us to emulate or imitate Christ as a work of the flesh, but to assimilate Christ as a satisfying feast. Amen.